Good morning. It's good to see everyone. Y'all look really good. Well, hey, what a gift is it to see and see what God's doing in people like Julian's life. Um, I get the pleasure of seeing Julian's life at RTI as a student. So we're really excited for what God has done in his past and also what he's doing in the future. Uh, Can we give it up for our worship team today? Wow, that was so good. Yeah, who needs caffeine when you got IPG leading, right? Well, as you guys know, we've been going through our sermon series, Kingdom Come. And we've been framing this uh, concept with this acronym known as AIM, which is Allegiance, Integration, and Mission. In the past few weeks, we've been going through the parables, specifically in Matthew 13, which is what we'll do today. But first, let me introduce myself. My name is Efren Perdomo. I'm the RTI Student Development Director. I know, it's a long title, but uh, so I work with RTI students. Uh, One of the new things about my job, though, is I am a part of the preaching team. So you'll get to see me a little bit more often. I don't know how you would take that, if you like that or not, but... So uh, last time I preached, this was around, I want to say, August, like the end of August. Um, A couple things have changed. One, I'm on staff. And second, I didn't have this glowing mustache on my face. So so those of you who didn't remember me, um, it's the first time I've ever had to worry about the mic hitting my whiskers. So, new thing. Well, like I said, many of you don't know me, so let me tell you a little bit about myself. Um, This is my year to turn 29, which in many ways is both a reflective year of leaving my 20s and also entering into my 30s, full adulthood. Uh, Last service, everyone laughed because, well, they're a little bit, it's a little bit of an older crowd. (laughs) And I don't mean that in a bad way. And I know many of you, maybe even in this service, like Steve Dangaran, who's my boss, are saying, man, if I could just be your age. He says that to me every single time. I say this to our RTI students as well, so it's kind of a cyclical thing going on there. So for those of you who are older, why don't you think back to that time in that year? And for those of you who are younger, why don't you listen to what you have to look forward to? As I think about my 20s, I often admire and reminisce at the blossoming of my creativity, my ambition, my vision of who I imagined I would become. To illustrate this, I would like to show a picture of myself. It's a little pixelated, but why don't you show that? Look at that. There's so many things wrong with this photo. One, I, this purple sweater that's super bright, the hat's barely on my head, and this amazing sword that I'm holding. Um, for those of you who don't know, I used to be a part of a LARPing community. Can't explain that now. You'd have to look that up on Google. Well, look at that. Youthful Ephron, so fierce, full of life, ready to take on the world. When this picture was taken, I had so many things I thought I would be. A famous punk musician, Muay Thai kickboxer, graphic designer, army ranger, knight leader of the Black Spire Kingdom. It's another LARPing term for those in the room. Now, it might not be so obvious, I didn't become any of those things. And to some degree, I have mixed feelings about that, Uh, some things I'm glad I didn't do, and some things I really miss. My guess is I'm not alone in this feeling. And for a lot of us, we recognize through the years, reality just tends to hit us in the face with disappointment, failed expectations, and the hard knocks of life, thus slowing down our youthful zeal. In many ways, this brings about grief a melancholic posture towards our future. We find it hard to dream again. And as we grow older, we're afraid to dream, unwilling to move outside our comfort zone. And in all reality, go into a process of feeling insignificant. Often this progresses throughout the stages in life. You start to look in the mirror, I'm 30, now I'm 40, 50, 60, 80, 
We start to lose our athleticism, memory, our keen sense of fashion, the ability to be hip, which Brian Condello knows all about. <laughs> Along with it comes, like I said, a sense of insignificance. You don't need me anymore. God doesn't need me anymore. And often we become despondent to God's invitation to dream with him again. And possibly more important, God's invitation to partner with him in kingdom work. In this message, my hope is that we would grasp how the nature of God's kingdom actually adds significance, not only to our work, but our place in life and location. I believe even in this short parable of the leaven, Jesus is intuitively pulling all of us from all stages of life and situations to partner with him in his kingdom work, kingdom expansion. So if you would, would you turn to Matthew uh, chapter 13, and we'll start in verse 33. Uh, just a note, I am reading out of the ESV, and that's what's up there on the screen. Usually we use the NLT, but there's particular reasons why I'm using the ESV for just this verse. So just, just so you guys are aware. So verse 33. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour till it was all leavened. All these things Jesus said to the crowds in parables. Indeed, he said nothing to them without a parable. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter what has been hidden since the foundation of the world. This is the word of the Lord. In this text, although small, we see three clear characteristics of Jesus' kingdom. And those are, it's hidden in nature, pervasive in influence, and cultivated by God. So along this, we'll go one by one. So with our first characteristics, hidden in nature, kingdom growth is not discouraged by the hidden outsider. Now the question many of you may be asking is how? How is this kingdom hidden? Jesus is pretty visible during his ministry. He's doing a lot of stuff. Miracles, healings. So why would you call it hidden? Well, much like a pun or a play on words, this parable seems to use vocabulary and imagery that not only would be shocking, but to some extent subversive. The two words to look at and to highlight are the words leaven and hid. First, let's consider the word choice of leaven. Leaven throughout Hebrew scriptures and also Greco-Roman literature always symbolically illustrated, not always, sometimes symbolically illustrated a corrupting influence. The idea of leaven permeating what, what is small and then slowly building. Think through with me the Passover feast in Exodus 12, its regulations in Leviticus 2, and even later on, Matthew himself records Jesus saying, watch and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Paul even says it, that a little leaven spoils the whole lump when referring to false teaching. And to illustrate this further, here's a quote from Plutarch around this same time. Leaven is both generated by corruption and also corrupts the mass with which it is mingled. And during this time, leaven was used symbolically of people groups, people who were outside of the Jewish community. And although it might be overstating it that this idea of leaven always symbolically referred to the outsider, it seems to me Jesus is doing something here. He's playing off what the Jewish leaders were thinking of his followers. They are the leaven, the outsiders who are corrupting our kingdom. But Jesus flips his imagery on its head and says, this leaven, these people are actually in fact what is growing my kingdom. Next, the parable says 
that the woman hid the leaven in the flour. This is actually a very obscure term to use in the Greek um, and is obscure for the task as well. But to the reader, functions as a textual wink. I'm not really good at winking, so that's my best attempt at doing it. You can tell I'm not good at flirting. So, Much like uh, in the ancient times, we don't have emojis. We don't have uh, emojis to write on our scrolls or their scrolls. So this functions as such. So not only is the growth of God's kingdom hidden because of the people, but also the way at its place. Hidden in nature because it's not the people who the crowds expected as you look through the disciples, but also the way they're used. As I reflect on this point, my mind immediately turns to the people God has used in early centuries. How God used them through martyrdom. That's right, death. Death actually being a conduit towards kingdom growth. And to illustrate this, in the third century, an emperor known as Septimius Severus established a policy that disallowed conversion to Christianity, which resulted in severe persecution during this time in Carthage, North Africa. And one person stands out. Her name, Vibia Perpetua. Vibia Perpetua being a new Christian, young, married, and mother to a newborn, was arrested along with others during this time for her newly found faith. Here's an excerpt from both her arrest and the others and their execution from the Acts of Christian Martyrs. Pay attention to this. The day of their victory dawned, and they marched from the prison to the amphitheater, joyfully, as though they were going to heaven, with calm faces, trembling, if at all, with joy rather than fear. Perpetua went along with a shining countenance and a calm step as the beloved of God, as a wife of Christ, putting down everyone's in stare by her own intense gaze. And they rejoiced at this, that they had obtained the Lord's sufferings. Others took the sword in silence. Perpetua, however, had yet to taste more pain. She screamed as she was struck at the bone. Then she took the trembling hand of the young gladiator, guided it to her throat. It was as though so great a woman, feared as she was by the unclean spirit, could not be dispatched unless she herself would be willing. What does that mean? It means that the growth of God's kingdom isn't contingent on power or prominence, but on our willingness to stand firm and be obedient to partner with God. You see, martyrdom eventually became what grew the church globally. The question then no longer becomes, who am I, but how and where will God use me? So then, how will God use our influence? This leads us to our next point. Pervasive in influence. Kingdom growth is not confined by time or the impossible. Think with me the contrast of the leaven with the flour. It highlights what a small and insignificant portion is able to do within the dough. Although your Bibles may say three measures of flour or something related, probably a more concrete term would be around 35 liters of flour. This signaling a huge feast, a lot of bread, able to feed 100 people. So not only does this imagery point us to contrast, something big, but actually points us to a text in Genesis 18.6. The only other time this measurement is used is in the story when the Lord and two visitors visit Sarah and Abraham. Scholars often note there's an illusion going on here, but we don't really know exactly what's the significance. 
What is going on? So if you will indulge me for a bit, here's my theory. The story comes off the tales of God promising Abraham a son in chapter 17. This son would later be known as Isaac, who would be the one God would make a multitude of nations, an everlasting covenant, i.e. a kingdom. The next chapter is a promise given to Sarah, and that's where we find this measurement. And what is their response? Laughter. Because what a ridiculous concept. Sarah, by this time, was over 100 years old. How could you expect to bear a child to create this kingdom, the multitude of nations? So then what's the connection? I believe Jesus is alluding to something here, a doubt. A doubt in what seems to be impossible circumstances of establishing first the kingdom, both to Sarah and Abraham in their context, but also its growth to the disciples during the first century. So it speaks to both of their doubts. One does not believe that she can bear a child. The other doesn't believe that the kingdom will grow out of these people, these peasants, who are the disciples, Jesus' followers, the outsiders. And to some extent, this is also alluding to something of a promise that we might never see come to fruition. Jesus calling to a work with a future promise, first a future promise of a multitude of nations that Abraham and Sarah never saw during their life, and also for us, a growth in, or disciples, a growth in the kingdom that would go globally, that they may never see its full fruit in its time. In our influence, we often want to stand out, want to be remarkable, want to be the one that is known by everyone. We change the world. Yet in God's kingdom, it seems that our influence actually doesn't need to stand out and isn't actually quick. But as Eugene Peterson says, a long obedience in the same direction. Consider this illustration of ants. Ants create sophisticated structures in ant hills, tunnels, um, even with their bodies are able to make bridges. And what's unique about this is that they're so small, they're fragile, How are they able to do such creative things together? Works better than my team, the son would say. And each one's work is viewed as a whole, not individually. Now pause. I know many of you may be saying, I don't like your analogy. I want to be different. I want to be unique. And maybe that's more my generation or or what have you. But I, I myself come from a music scene where we all want to be the black sheep. We all want to stand out. And even though it's scriptural that we're diverse, as we saw today, diverse body, it seems that there's a beauty in the unity of this influence. We're all in the same direction towards Christ-likeness, working towards kingdom expansion. Our work is not viewed individually, but actually viewed as a whole. And it's time. It takes time. No one notes that it takes time for the leaven to permeate the dough. It's humble influence. The famous philosophers, fleet foxes, capture this idea actually quite well in their opening verse. They're not philosophers, they're actually just a band that I really like. (laughs) This says, I was raised up believing I was somehow unique. Like a snowflake distinct among snowflakes, unique in each way you can see. And now, after some thinking, I'd say I'd rather be a functioning cog in some great machinery serving something beyond me. The paradox of this influence is that it's slow, it's unified, and it's patient love. Not quick results, charisma, or skill to stand out for ego's sake. 
So then how is God wanting to use our influence for his kingdom with both a patient posture and also a selfless one? How then do I see my role in all of this, in this kingdom you're describing? How do I partner with God? This leads to our third, third characteristic, cultivated by God. Kingdom growth is not demonstrated outside of God's dominion. The text in this portion is actually quite clear in this parable and also the previous one. God cultivates the growth. God permeates the dough, leavens it, which to some of us is humbling, like myself. I want to stand out. I want to be known. I want people to know me. But it's also liberating because if everything falls apart, there's someone there to clean it up. And with that, I have one final textual note. And you'll have to forgive me because it's, I'm about to get real nerdy here, and I don't mean to, but I feel this is super interesting. Often in Greek sentences in the New Testament, they'll always include a passive verb without an agent or actor being expressed. This is actually a literary device used in Hebrew um, which Matthew would definitely be a king to using. And the reason for it is this literary device is in order to highlight what is known to Greek grammarians as the divine passive. And what this simply means is this with this Greek verb that has no agent or actor express, it's because there's an obvious knowledge of who is the immediate agent. God himself. And that's actually what's happening in this verse and in the previous parable. You have two verbs in the passive tense or passive voice that are growing. So as Rob talked about the tree growing in uh, the mustard seed, there's a passive verb. And as you see in this parable, the leavening process, as it's leavened and rises, it's a passive verb. God is the immediate agent. To illustrate our partnership, what comes to mind is my nephews. So if you could show that picture of them. Oh, so cute, right? Oh my gosh. So the far left, that's Ezra, Silas, and Oliver. They are extremely wild, crazy, and so much fun. One of the things they love to do is grab my car keys and throw it out in the middle of nowhere so that I have to find it. It's the most annoying thing, but it's so funny, and I almost give them kudos for it, because they're hilarious. One of the things I think about is how they love to help. They love cleaning dishes, making breakfast, baking, cleaning, woodworking projects even. This is a picture of uh, Ezra and Silas helping my sister-in-law make icing. As you can tell, they're a big help, right? Just licking the icing off there. And now if all the parents in the room are honest, and even the grandparents or uncles and aunts, we know that they often add more work than help when they help us. Yet we find pleasure and delight in working with them through the mess. One, because they're cute. Another, because it bonds us together. One of the beautiful moments one gets to see is when they actually transition from making more work to actually helping. And I really believe that as a parent lovingly includes their child, so does God partner with us in his kingdom work. God expects our hiccups, our messes, but also delights in the process when we actually help. And he's right there to clean our messes and work alongside us. What this means is our partnership is merely a delight of the Father. It's not a necessity. He doesn't need us. But it's also an invitation to grow with him together, to build a bond. So then where is the place that God is already at work that he's inviting you to partner with him? This is a point where we give you an application. We know that a text is not enough. We, the scriptures are always calling us to application, to move, 
There's always an imperative. This parable isn't just meant to stimulate the mind, but actually move towards action. Partnering with God. The design of this kingdom is God's ability to use everyone in this room, regardless of age, vocation, influence, possibly illness, or even past. God is inviting us all for kingdom growth. Kingdom cultivation demands the obedience of its citizens, not prominence. I'll say that one more time. Kingdom cultivation demands the obedience of its citizens, not prominence. And as much as God has invited us, we must center ourselves to invite him. And like any discipline, you begin with prayer. Often in our RTA classes, when a student goes to application and immediately goes to prayer, we say that's a cop-out, but in this instance, I'm using it. <laughs> um, but we only say that because every, every application could be turned into prayer. So uh, as we're going through this, I want to give you some prayer prompts because we love prayer prompts here at Salem Alliance. And the hope that these prayer prompts would invite you to add clarity to the process of God's invitation, but more importantly, to intentionally invite God himself. And those questions are the what, the where, and the how. It's beginning with the first one, what. What is your hidden invitation for kingdom growth? What is the thing that I cannot see that you see the potential of bearing fruit? What is the thing inside myself that I cannot see that you're looking to use? The where. Where is the place you want me to use my influence? It's a question about location. Where are you at? Where are your spheres of influence? Who's following you? And lastly, how. How are you inviting me to cultivate kingdom growth? It's a question of method, and oftentimes we like to omit God in the process of method, but I believe it's an important part to invite God on how do we do this? Where do you want me to do this? So with that, I'd like to end with one story about my old youth pastor, James Dick. James gets confused for Steve Irwin a lot, as you can see. James was a faithful man, pastor who served most of his career in a small church in Redmond, Oregon. And before I left for college, even before that as well, he took me under his wing. He discipled and mentored me, loved me, and even created a speech class when I didn't know how to public speak. Many times we hung out, I just remember being in awe. This guy has great wisdom, character, compassion, and is fully attentive to who I am. But I also remember, in the back of my mind, saying, I do not want to be a 50-year-old youth pastor in the same old town doing the same old thing. Years went by, and unfortunately, we lost James. James was taken early from us due to a constant battle with a brain tumor. And probably one of my strongest memories and probably the best lesson I received early in my ministry career was entering that church building. Immediately struck, packed. The whole town was seriously there. Story after story, spectrum of spectrum of people who you wouldn't know would know each other, but they knew each other because of one person, James. James loved, had compassion, it was truly beautiful to see. And you may be asking, what's special about him? And to be honest, I, I don't know. Um, externally, James was just a humorous Canadian who loved Jesus and people. James lived big, but loved bigger. As Eugene Peterson says, a long obedience in the same direction. And his influence was simple. It was an obedience to his post, to love his neighbor, and to imitate Jesus along the way. And ironic enough, 
I remember sitting in the pew of the ceremony and thinking in my head, that's how I want to be. That's the man I want to be. And I believe that's the people God is calling us to be. Ambassadors of God's kingdom, willing to work and partner with him in the work he's already doing. And the beauty of that is that he sees each and every one of you and knows your context, knows your person, knows your limitations, your fragility, and yet is still inviting you. Let's pray. God, we know that we have things that limit us from working in your kingdom, but that you still see right through it and provide the strength and the spirit to work alongside you and to build your kingdom and to see you as king who is good and loving, gracious Father. We love you and we thank you for meeting us in this place. Would you call us to something bigger than ourselves? Call us to your work. And in your lovely name we pray, amen. Well, before you guys head out, um, two things. If you are looking for prayer, um, need comfort in this time, we do have a team that meets right over here on this side. Um, So feel free to do that after service. Right over here, one of the first invitations that Jesus gives us is an invitation to follow him. So if that's you, I encourage you to run to the cross. One last thing, here's a benediction to lead us out. This is from Joel chapter 2, verse 28 through 29. So if you would stand with me and pull your hands out to receive this blessing. Then after doing all these things, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams, and your young men will see visions. And in those days, I will pour out my spirit even on servants, men and women alike. Be blessed and have a good morning. Thank you guys.